So hello everyone, welcome to the Glowdorm Trainee Committee's uh, monthly webinar for the month of March. Um, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Daniela Armijo and Dr. Natalia Marino Senekovic presenting on psoriasis treatment today from Chile. And I'm Akash, the chair of the Glowdorm Trainee Committee for this year. And my co-host is Dr. Cindy Malira. Um, so just to go over what we are as a Glowdrum Trainee Committee, um, we are part of the Glowdrum International Alliance for Global Health Dermatology, and our mission is to promote knowledge equity by improving access to education for dermatology trainees across the world. And to do this, we aim to provide free educational events and opportunities to build networks and to collaborate. So just some meeting etiquette for the remainder of the meeting um, for the participants that have joined us today. Um, so just please make sure that your audio stays muted. Your camera and audio will be muted during the duration of this webinar. If you do have any questions or comments, you can please share them via the chat function. And either Cindy or I will share these with the speakers at the end of the webinar. And we will also be sharing some information about the Glowdrum Trainee Committee and the chat function. So please um, do take a look at that when you get a chance. And if you're interested, we'd be happy to hear where you are all coming from. So you can comment um, your name and location in the chat um, as you wish. Um, so um, without further ado, we'll have Dr. Senekovic share her cases to begin today's presentation. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, all good. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay, now it's okay. Hi, I'm Natalia Merino. Uh, in this case, in this moment, I will present the case, cases of severe psoriasis. But before I start this presentation, I want to explain to you about the scenario of the psoriasis treatment in Peru and in Chile, because I will present one case of each country. I work in Peru in a public hospital. And if a patient with severe psoriasis needs a biological treatment, I have to start with anti tnf therapy, and I only can choose between infliximab or tanercept. In Chile, the state only pays for biological treatment if the patient has psoriasis arthritis. So if only have severe psoriasis, the patient has to pay it. We start with the first case. This case is a man, he's 58 years old, he has hypertension, he takes dosartan and lanolipine, also have hepatomegaly and obesity. He was diagnosed of psoriasis in 1985. He received topical treatment with steroid and moisturizer for 20 years. In 2005, uh, his doctor decided to start a citrotine, but he received it for a few months because elevated liver enzymes so they have to stop it. And he continued for, all, for other 20 years with topical treatment. Uh, when he came to the hospital, he had a body mass index of 32. Beside the dermatological lesions, everything was normal. About the dermatological examination, uh, in his first visit, he had a passy of 29. In this photo, we can see extensive infiltrates, erythematose, plaques on the legs, and he had similar lesions on the trunk and arms. In this photo, the, this lesion impressed as ostracis psoriasis. So we decide that we have to start a systemic treatment 
and we do some lab tests, double tests, everything was normal. We only find in the ultras, in the abdominal ultrasound hepatomegaly. And uh, we decide to start with a turner set and anti TNF therapy. Uh, we start with 50 milligrams twice weekly for 12 weeks uh, la, as the induction dose. And then he continued with 50 milligrams per week. He also received topical treatment like steroids, salicylic acid, vaseline, and other moisturizer treatment. And 12 weeks later, we can see this photo when the patient improved his lesions. Here, we only can see post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. In the lumbar area, we can see these small plaques. Uh, these are slightly infiltrate. Uh, he had similar lesions on the legs, small plaques. And he had a passy of 4.6. So now our patient is really happy with the result of the treatment. And now we have the second case. He's also a man. He's 52 years old. He also has hypertension. And he was diagnosed with psoriasis when he was 25. 25. He doesn't have psoriasis arthritis. Uh, when he was diagnosed with psoriasis, he received PUBA. He received thirty session, but it doesn't go well. It didn't go well, so they, he started with metrotexate. He received metrotexate for one year with patient response. So he received cyclosporin, but he only received this treatment for three months because he started exacerbating psoriasis. So he has to return to metrotexate and receive for one year, also with partial response. In this point, his doctor this decide to start biological treatment, and therein they decide to use secukinumab and anti-interleukin-17 the therapy. And he received for five years, and everything was okay. But five years later, the patient went to the clinic with these lesions, he have an infiltrated, well delimited, scaly plaque on the leg, which really affect his quality of life. He was so affected that he didn't want to use shorts in summer, for example. So his doctor decided to do something and they add to the treatment metrotrexate and topical treatment like betametasone or plus carcipotriol which partial response, but six months later, the plaque got worse and he also had new lesions on the skull. So they decide to use a new therapy and they decide to start with Rizankizumab and anti 23 therapy. Uh, they do the blood tests, everything was okay. He didn't have infection and the liver was okay. So here we have a photo after well, one week after the first dose of Rizankizumab and our patient was really happy because here we can see a regression of the plaque with improvement of the central area. Uh, here we can see the lesion more closely and we can see that he has normal skin in the central area. So with only one week of uh, after the first dose, we have excellent results. Well, this is the two cases and I leave you with Dr. Mijo. Thank you. No. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Natalia. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for being there. Thanks to the organizers of the Rotherham Alliance. My name is Dr. Daniel Armijo. I am a dermatologist from Chile, and today we are going to talk about psoriasis treatment. These are my conflicts of interest. During the last two decades, significant advances in the therapeutics fields of psoriasis have been done. Initially, we only had methotrexate, acetretine, and cyclosporin, but then after 2004, with the development of different biologics and small molecules, now we have uh, different um, options for the treatment for psoriasis. There are many factors that you should consider before choosing a treatment. There are patient-related factors like the age, sex, comorbidities, pregnancy, breastfeeding. There are also disease-related factors like the phenotype, the severity of the disease, the involvement of special areas, and the response to previous treatments. And drug-related factors like the safety, efficacy, effects on comorbidities, the cost, and of course, as Natalia also said before, the availability. Well, one of the first factors when approaching the treatment of psoriasis is to define the severity of the disease. Um, there's no a consensus on the definition of severity, but um, one of the most used is the rule of tense, which as you may know, consists of dividing the disease into mild or moderate to severe, depending on the patient having a BSA more than 10, a PASI more than 10, and or a DLQI more than 10. Recently, the IPC proposed a recategorization of the severity of the disease, and it consists of dividing into two main categories, a patient candidate for topicals, or a patient candidate for systemics, including those with a BSA more than 10, disease involving in special areas, and failure to topical therapy. There are different clinical guidelines um, for the treatment of psoriasis around the world, which adjust their recommendations according to the local regulations um, or the drug availability, but this is one an overall approach if we have a patient with plaque psoriasis. Um, does the patient have psoriatic arthritis? If the answer is no, so is it mild or a patient candidate for topicals? Uh, then the alternatives are topical treatment or targeted phototherapy. If the disease is moderate or severe, so the treatment options are systemics like biologics or oral medication, and or phototherapy. When the patient has psoriatic arthritis, so the recommendation is to choose a treatment suitable for both conditions, regardless the severity of the psoriasis. And those are systemics like biologics and or oral therapies and um, adjunctive therapies as needed. Now let's talk briefly about the different uh, options the different existing treatments. Uh, for 10 reasons, I cannot talk in deeply about all of them, but I will deal with the ones which are used more regularly. I would like to start with topicals and then I'm going to move to the other treatment options. In this group, we have corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, keratolytics, vitamin D analogs, and neotopicals molecules. Corticosteroids, are the mainstream therapy for most patients with mild or localized psoriasis. They have anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, and locally vasoconstrictive effect. Their efficacy is based on the class, being class one, the superpotent, and class seven, the least potent. The strength and vehicle should be chosen depending on body location. For example, for the trunk, you will choose a class one or three, and for the face, axillary, and genitals, a class seven or six. Uh, sorry, yes, seven or six. Uh, let's see, calcineurin inhibitors. Um, they are used mainly for face, axillary, and groin region. Their potency is similar to corticosteroids class six or seven. They have a safe profile, 
but initial burning and pruritus may occur. Uh, and this is, uh, could be manageable with prior administration of corticosteroids. Let's see vitamin D analogs. They have modest efficacy when used alone, but in combination with corticosteroids, they can improve their efficacy. They are safe, effective, and well tolerated in long term use in an as needed regimen. Common adverse effects are burning, pruritus, skin irritation, which usually lessen over time. Let's see keratolytics. The most used are tasarotene and salicylic acid. They improve the scales, but can cause irritation. Now let's have a look at new molecules. Sabinarov cream 1% has been approved for other patients with plaque psoriasis. Sabinarov that regulates pro-inflammatory cytokines as L17 and regulates the expression of the skin barrier proteins like filagrin and loricrine. It's a once daily cream monotherapy and it's safe and effective for long-term use and it's tolerable even on external sensitive areas. Common adverse effects this, uh, are folliculitis, nasopharyngitis, contact dermatitis, among others. Let me remind you that topicals can be used as monotherapy, but um, they are important as an adjunctive therapy as well, because systemic therapy is not always uh, achieve complete clearance in all patients. Now let's have a look at phototherapy. Excimer light is a very good option for localized psoriasis, while UVB, Naroband, and PUVA are um, the most used for moderate to severe psoriasis. Um, the use of phototherapy has decreased to the, the biologic therapy and because traveling to undergo office-based phototherapy is challenging for patients sometimes. Let's see UVB narrowband. It decreases DNA synthesis, uh, producing keratinocytes apoptosis and decreases the production of apoptotic cytokines. Compared to broadband UVB, it has a greater efficacy, longer duration of remission and lower photocarcinogenic potential. It is commonly prescribed two to three times per week during the first three months. On the other hand, PUVA is a UVA plus soralen taken orally or topically prior to UVA irradiation. PUVA is more efficient than UVB narrowband, but it has risk of skin cancer with the long-term use. Topically, PUVA is commonly used for palmoplantar psoriasis, and common adverse effects are gastrointestinal upset, burning, pruritus, and photoaging. Phototherapy is a safe therapy. However, it is contraindicated in conditions with increased sensitivity to light and history of melanoma. PUVA cannot be used in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Now let's move on to systemic conventional therapies. Here we have methotrexate, acetretin, and cyclosporin. They have been used for many years before biologics. They have lower efficacy rates compared to biologics, except for cyclosporin, and they can be considered in patients who may have limited access to biologics or as an adjunctive therapy. First, let's see methotrexate. It's a dehydrofolate reductase inhibitor. The dose varies between 15 to 25 milligrams per week plus folic acid supplementation. Methotrexate has risk of hepatic, hematological, and renal toxicity, so the monitorization should be done with blood count, liver and renal function, and hepatitis serology. Methotrexate is contraindicated in serious liver or kidney disease, in pregnancy, or currently trying to conceive children, in cases of breastfeeding, in patients with alcohol abuse and severe infections. Let's see acetretin, it's an oral retinoid um, taken 10 to 15 milligrams per day. 
a higher the dose, a higher the risk of adverse effects. Its onset of action is eight weeks and is preferred for palmoplantar pustular psoriasis, generalized pustular psoriasis, history of skin cancer and or malignancy. Common adverse effects are hair loss, cirrhosis, hypertriliceridemia, hepatotoxicity, and teratogenicity. Acetretin is contraindicated in severe liver or renal impairment, in pregnancy, and important in women of childbearing age, and breastfeeding. Let's see cyclosporin is an oral calcineurin inhibitor taken in a twice daily divided dose of five milligrams kilo a day, has a fast onset of action around two weeks, um, but it cannot be used in the long term because of the risk of adverse effects like nephrotoxicity, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. The monitorization should be done with kidney function, electrolytes, and blood pressure. Cyclosporin is contraindicated in severe infections and control high blood pressure renal failure and history or current malignancy. Now let's get started with biologics, the newest drugs developed for the treatment of psoriasis. Here we have uh, four different groups, anti-TNF-alpha, anti-IL-12 and 23, anti-IL-17, anti-IL-23. It's not the principal objective of this presentation to talk extensively about the pathophysiology of psoriasis, but here in this slide, you have all the biologics and the exact point where they act. Anti-TNF-alpha blocks the activation of myeloid dendritic cells, which are responsible for the production of IL-12 and IL-23. IL-12 induces the differentiation of T helper one, and IL-23 induces the differentiation of T helper 17 and T helper 22, uh, which are responsible for the production of IL-17 and other inflammatory uh, cytokines, producing an inflammatory cascade. Let's see anti-TNF alpha. Here we have four biologics approved for plaque psoriasis, etanercept, infliximab, Adalimumab and Sertolizumab Pegol. Anti TNF alpha is the oldest group of biologics. They have greater efficacy compared to conventional systemics, but lower efficacy compared to the newest ones. Because of their mechanism of action, they have risk of reactivation of latent tuberculosis. Among TNF alpha group, Infliximab has greater efficacy, however, also greater risk of severe infections. Infliximab is a weight-based drug, so it is recommended to obese patients. And sertolizumab as being pegylated is preferred during pregnancy and breastfeeding because of minimal placenta and milk transfer. They are contraindicated in cases of multiple sclerosis, heart failure, latent tuberculosis, hypersensitivity, and of course, active infections. Now let's see Ustekinumab is the anti-IL-12 and 23. Ustekinumab inhibits subunit P40, which is shared by IL-12 IL and 23. Similar than infliximab is a weight-based drug, so it is also good for obese patients has a safe profile and common adverse effects are respiratory tract infections and headache. Now let's move on to the IL-17, anti-IL-17 group. Here we have secukinumab, exekizumab, and brodalumab. This group has a fast onset of action and a robust response. Adverse effects are mucocutaneous candidiasis, exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disease. Secukinumab has also shown to be highly effective in treating scalp psoriasis, nails, and palmoplantar psoriasis. When prescribing brodalumab, you should weigh risks and benefits in patients with suicidal ideation. Now let's see the newest group of biology. 
Pesankizumab and Tiltrapizumab. This group inhibits P19 subunit of IL-23. Gustelkumab and Resankizumab have an impressive efficacy and a fast onset of action. They have a safe profile and the infrequent scheme dosing is very convenient for patients. Adverse effects are upper respiratory tract infections and injection site reactions. Ustekinumab, anti-IL-17 and anti-IL-23 are contraindicated in cases of hypersensitivity to the drug, active infections, pregnancy and breastfeeding because more studies are needed. And as I said before, IL-17 should be avoided in inflammatory bowel disease. Now let's talk briefly about the small molecules, apremilast and ducravacitinib. Apremilast is a phosphodiesterase for inhibitor. Its efficacy is quite similar than methotrexate. And one of the main advantages is that a strict laboratory monitorization is not needed. Adverse effects are diarrhea, nausea, asthenia, headache, depression, and weight loss. And similar than brodalumab, you should weigh the risks versus on benefits in patients with suicidal behavior or ideation. It's contraindicated in hypersensitivity and pregnancy. Now let's see ducravacitinib. It's an oral selective piercing kinase 2 inhibitor. TIC2 mediates signaling of IL-23. And ducravacitinib has shown to be superior uh, than placebo and apremilast. Adverse effects this, uh, reported are nasopharyngitis, acne, folliculitis, and herpes zoster. Now we have talked about almost all the existing treatments for psoriasis. I would like to share with you some slides in some common um, comorbidities. Uh, uh, how to choose a therapy is some common comorbidities. And psoriatic arthritis, if you have a peripheral psoriatic arthritis, one of the first options could be methotrexate. And in, in, if non responders, anti TNF alpha, ustekinumab, and anti IL 17 would be a good alternative. In cases of inflammatory bowel disease, as first choice, you have infliximab, adalimumab, sertonizumab, and ustekinumab. And as I said before, anti IL 17A should be avoided. In cases of malignancy, first choices are topicals, acetretin, and UVB in our band, as they don't decrease the immune system. Other treatments like methotrexate or the other biologics could be used case by case, including a discussion with cancer specialists. Cyclosporin, however, should be avoided. Cardiovascular disease, first choice could be methotrexate, ustekinumab, and anti IL 17, but acetretin and cyclosporin should be avoided. In obese patients, as I said before, infliximab and ustekinumab are the first options. The other treatments are also suitable. However, methotrexate, as it has risk of fatty liver, should be avoided. In contesting heart failure, you, you should remember that cyclosporin should be avoided and anti-TNF alpha are contraindicated. And in multiple sclerosis, fumarates are recommended, but remember that anti-TNF alpha are contraindicated. So to sum up, huge advances in the therapeutics for psoriasis have been done in the last few years. The choice of a treatment must weight patient characteristics, think, taking into special consideration the comorbidities, disease features, and drug-related factors. With this slide, I conclude my presentation. I hope it could be useful for all of you. Now I would, I would like to share some slides. Let's move on to some multiple choice questions. Akash, is, is everything okay with the poll? 
Yes, let me put it up okay. right now. Um, participants, if you can see the poll, you can put in your answers now. Okay, well, shall I start? Sure, I don't know if the poll is getting through the participants. So for this question, we'll, um, we'll just let you uh, go. No, okay, for the next one. For, okay, case one, this is a man 42 years old. He was diagnosed with psoriasis when he was 25 years old. He is obese with high blood pressure and depression with previous history of suicidal ideation. Physical examination revealed extensive erythematous scaly plaques on his trunk, groin, and scalp. The BSA was 13, PASI 11, and DLQI 18. So first question, which one would be your first clinical approach? A, a premilast, B, lab blood test, prior systemics, and adjunctive th uh, topical therapy, start in fliximab right away, or phototherapy and topicals. Okay, good. So, uh, okay, good. Lab blood test, prior systemics, and adjunctive topical therapy would be the the best option. Um, starting a premilast right away uh, could be, but the patient have um, depression and societal behavior, so maybe would not be my first option. And start infliximab up right away without doing any uh, lab blood test. Um, I, I wouldn't have choose that uh, alternative as first choice. So. Lab blood tests were done. He had uh, elevated transaminase and raised glucose and quantiferum test was positive. And the rest of the tests were on a normal branch. In your opinion, which treatment could be the most suitable? Okay, so 75% answered um, alternative C to initiate tuberculosis prophylaxis uh, for at least one month before, before beginning with biologics. Yeah, I think I, I would do the same. Methotrexate could be an option, but remember the patient was obese um, with uh, raised uh, liver enzymes so maybe he has uh, 
fatty liver, uh, I would choose a biologic um, for the treatment. UVB phototherapy, yes, could also be an option, but um, there's only one answer to that. Yeah, I would say uh, um, alternative C is the best option. So this is a second case, a woman of 78 years old. She was diagnosed with psoriasis six years ago. She was treated in the past with topicals and methotrexate without clinical improvement. One year ago, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She was treated with lobotomy and two months ago, she had a tumor recurrence treated with radiotherapy. The last month, she, she also had a psoriasis flare Severely, severely affecting her quality of life. Physical examination revealed erythematous plaque psoriasis on her elbows, hands, knees, pretibial area, nails, and scalp. BSA was 9, PASI 10, and DLQI 20. Which treatment would you prescribe for the patient as a first option? Good. I'm sorry, I have just noticed the alternatives were, <laughs> were on black. But okay, acetretin and topicals plus or UVB in our band um, would be the most suitable option. You are very good students. So thank you. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Armijo. So I think we just have a few questions um, from the um, from the participants. Um, Cindy, would you mind um, presenting those to Dr. Armijo? Thank you, Akash. Um, thank you uh, for the session. The first question is, in a place where biologics are not available, like in most African countries, what would you recommend for obese patients, acetretin, cyclosporin, Yes, well, uh, it is not an absolute contraindication method of trace state. Um, here in Chile, we don't have, as Natalia said uh, before, uh, we don't, uh, yeah, we have uh, biologics available, but here we don't have um, economic reimbursement for, for the drugs, so the patient needs to pay um, for all of them. So method of trace state is not an absolute contraindication. Uh, yeah, acetretin could be an option, and cyclosporin is also a good alternative, but you cannot use it in the long term. And you, you need to take care um, uh, about the, the contraindications of hyperlipidemia and hypertension that are common comorbidities in obese patients. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is, in a black male with plaques on the forehead, what is the best form of treatment? Uh, if, the, if the patient uh, has only plaques on his forehead, and you, you can use a topical, maybe um, a lower class corticosteroids or a calcineurin inhibitor could be uh, good options for the face. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is um, the best therapy for patients with acrodermatitis continua of halopu associated with psoriatic arthritis. Yeah, well, a, bi a biologic um, 
will work for, for both conditions, uh, anti-TNF-alpha, anti-IL-17 would be my first choices. All right. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How long does if the Natalia, if, if, if Natalia wants to participate, she can do it as well. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So the question is, how long does the patient take the biologics, uh, say um, interleukin-23 inhibitors? Oh, hi. Uh, it depends on the response of the patient. Uh, uh, now they are talking about, about, about the stop the therapy, but maybe one or two years ago, we used to see that when we start and therapy and biological therapy, we have to continue forever. But now we know that maybe if I have a patient uh, wait one year with a good response, I have I can't stop the therapy. Maybe I can prolong the the time of the dose of each dose. But you have to wait for one year with one, with good response. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is do you start tuberculosis treatment for all patients before initiating biologics? Uh, hi, well, uh, you don't have, you have to do quantiferont and you have to do a chest radiography to look uh, if the patient has latent tuberculosis or doesn't. But you have to do some exams to look for tuberculosis. You can start biological without investigating tuberculosis. Okay, thank yes, you. Very I, 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 I do agree with Natalia. It's not um, a recommendation to start tuberculosis prophylaxis in all patients. Um, you just need to check for the latent tuberculosis and if it's present, then you can treat the patient and after a month of treatment, you can initiate the biologics. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback, for your response. Uh, that's it for the questions. Um, sorry, we have one just that has come in. Once you have started biologics, can you go back to topicals once the patient has improved? Did you get the question? Yeah. Oh, would yes, you be so yes. kind to repeat it? Um, once you have started uh, biologics, can you go back to topicals once the patient has improved? Okay, Nati. Uh, yes, uh, you can, if the patient is okay with good response, you can back to the topical therapy. But all, all depends on the response of the patient. As I said, in the first question, you can wait for one year with good response and you can stop the biologic therapy and you can't continue with topicals. Yes, well, uh, biologics have been developed to be used as a chronic therapy, but um, yeah, it always depends on the patient, the patient response. So yeah, you, you can stop biologics and go back to to topicals or another systemic conventional treatment if you need to. All right, uh, for our final question for the day, what would you recommend for a pregnant woman who is uh, presenting with severe pustular psoriasis with no biologics in the setting? Well, it's, uh... It's a difficult question. Maybe, uh, yeah, well, if you don't have um, biologics, um, phototherapy maybe could be an option, but uh, it, it is, of course, it is compli a complicated case. What do you think, Mati? Oh, yes, phototherapy is, is a good option. It's a good option uh, because you can use metrotexate or acetatine, maybe cyclosporine. Yeah, maybe cyclosporin could be could be a good option to to uh, to reduce the lesions and uh, yeah. 
Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this session. Um, back to you, Akash. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for your participation, um, all the attendees. And thank you so much, Dr. Um, Armijo and Dr. Marino for taking the time out of your day to present to us and share your knowledge with us. Um, so this concludes the webinar for today. Um, please be on the lookout on our Instagram and Twitter handles for um, updates on the next webinar, which will be taking place on April 21st with Dr. Zenis on guide mapping, guideline mapping in um, from the UK. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the promotional material ready for it, so I was unable to share that on the screen today, um, but it'll be shared on our social media platforms shortly. Um, with that, um, I think we can conclude today's webinar. Thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.